Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft. In this video, we're going to look at how we can time algorithms on a computer. When we introduce numerical algorithms, we can theoretically analyze their performance in terms of the number of floating point operations that they might take. But it's often really useful to compare those theoretical predictions with real-world timing values that can indicate how an algorithm might perform in practice. In this video, we're going to take a look at some functions we can use to time algorithms, and we'll also take a look at some of the subtleties that are involved in measuring time on a computer. And we'll illustrate this through a few different examples. We'll finish with a small discussion of sparse matrices that can often result in large improvements in algorithmic performance if we have that type of matrix structure. In the previous videos, we showed that for an n by n matrix, the LU factorization could be performed in operations that scale like 2 thirds n cubed. We also saw that for an n by n symmetric positive definite matrix, the Cholesky factorization could be performed in operations that scale like 1 third n cubed. And these asymptotic expressions that capture the leading order computational time can be really helpful in, for us to understand the size of problem that we might be able to tackle on our computer. And we calculated these asymptotic expressions by analyzing the algorithms and looking at the number of floating point operations that were required. But often these asymptotic expressions might overlook certain aspects of real-world performance. When we run a program on a computer, there are various other hardware aspects, such as memory bandwidth, that might actually affect the time taken for our algorithm to run. And in this video, we're going to look at how we can actually time algorithms in practice. And this can help us compare to our theoretical expressions for performance and understand if there are any differences that come about due to running in the real world. There are several subtleties about timing how long it takes for a program to run on a computer. And to illustrate this, let's introduce two different ways that we can think about time. So the first method is wall clock time. And this is defined in terms of the passage of time that you as a programmer experience. It's the time that you would see if you were looking at the clock on the wall. Another way we can think about time for computer programs is processor time. And that's the amount of time that your program actually spends being processed on your computer's CPU. Now, suppose that you had a program that you expected to take 10 seconds, and you ran this on a computer that had nothing else running on it. Then in that case, you might find that the wall clock time works out to be roughly 10 seconds. And in this case, you might also find that the processor time works out to be roughly 10 seconds. Now consider the alternative situation where your computer is actually under heavy load and a number of other jobs are running on it simultaneously. In this case, what will happen is that your computer has to juggle your task with all of the other programs on the system and it will rapidly switch your task onto the CPU to run bits of it in conjunction with all of the other tasks that are running. So in this case, you might find that the wall clock time is significantly longer than 10 seconds. Perhaps it works out to be about 30 seconds. However, the processor time would still roughly be 10 seconds because that's still the amount of time that your job actually has to spend being processed. So this example highlights some of the complexities of timing. Often, as programmers, we're ultimately interested in wall clock time. And that is really the measure that we'll use to evaluate how long something would take. But as shown in this example, processor time is often more insensitive to some of the aspects of running in the real world. And it's often useful for us to have both of these notions of time available to us. In addition, when we start to think about multiprocessor jobs or parallel jobs, then these aspects of timing become more complex. We're now going to look at an example that can highlight the difference between wall clock time and processor time. 
But before doing this, we need to address a few other aspects of modern computer hardware that can be important for timing studies. Firstly, since the mid-2000s, most CPUs that you can buy for laptops and desktops actually have multiple independent cores in them that can process instructions independently and simultaneously. It's common nowadays to have laptops and desktops that have dual core, quad core, or even eight core or 16 core CPUs in them. And this will definitely affect how our CPU may handle different tasks. In addition, over the last decade, manufacturers such as Intel and AMD have introduced a technology referred to as hyperthreading, which means that each physical core in a CPU can actually manifest to the system as two virtual cores. So this can mean that a dual core CPU can actually show up as having four independent cores. And this is done by rapidly switching two different processes on the same physical core. And this technology can certainly help on many operating systems for rapidly handling many different processes running simultaneously, such as if you've got applications with many different threads that are running simultaneously. But it can cause some difficulties when we come to measure the performance of scientific algorithms. And ultimately, we can find that the performance is often limited by the number of physical cores that are present. And we'll now look at this example and both of these aspects of multi-core and hyperthreading will become apparent. We're now going to take a look at the program TimingTest.py that can demonstrate some of the timing features within Python. And I'm going to run this test by remotely logging in to an Intel NUC that is a small modular computer. And I chose this computer because it has a dual core processor. And this will be useful for looking at how different versions of this timing test interact with each other. So I have two windows open here that are remotely logged into this computer. And I'm first going to check what CPU this computer has. And to do this, I'm going to look at the special file on Linux, which is called slash proc slash CPU info that contains all of this information about the CPU of the computer. And I'm going to look for the phrase model name that will tell us about the particular model name of the CPU. And when I do this, I see that this is a Core i7-7567U CPU, uh, which dates from around 2017. And I see that it actually shows up four times here. And that is because it is a dual core computer, but with hyperthreading, it shows up to the system as having four virtual cores. So let me now take a look at the program over here. So this program is going to use the time module in Python, and it's going to make use of the time function and the process time function. And these functions are both available in recent versions of Python 3. So the time function gives us a measure of wall clock time, the physical passage of time, as you would observe uh, by looking at a wall clock. And the process time gives us a measure of the process time and tells us how long this program has actually spent running on the processor. So I'm first going to get initial values of these two counters, and then I'm going to carry out a large arbitrary calculation where I just do a few for loops and add some numbers together. And I'm then going to look at the total wall clock time taken and the total process time taken by looking at how the counters have progressed. And I'll print these out, and I'll also look at the ratio between the two. So let me first run one copy of this program. And before doing this, I'm going to launch the htop utility in this other window. And that will actually show me what the different cores of the CPU are doing. So currently, all of them are roughly idle. And once I start running jobs, then we'll see that they are in use. So let me run here one copy of the timing test program. And as this is running, we see that one core is now running at 
and this job takes around 7.05 seconds in wall clock time and we actually see in this in this situation that the process time is actually the same and we just get a ratio of one in this case. So on Linux, we actually have the capability to run several copies of a program simultaneously. And to do this, we use the following syntax. We can say that for A in one and two, to make two different instances, we can then use the notation of putting this in brackets and adding an ampersand at the end. And what this does is that when I run it, it creates two copies of this time and test program and the ampersand detaches those from the shell so that they'll both run simultaneously. So if I do that, then I now see that two of my cores are running in the HTOP window and both of them will report back a time here. And we actually see that because the shell detached those programs, then one of the messages actually appears as though it's on the shell prompt. And in this case, we also see that the time and the process time give us the same measure. And again, we get a ratio of one. It's actually slightly shorter than the previous test. And that could just be due to some small random variations. So now let's look at the case when we would run four of these jobs simultaneously. And so now we see that all four virtual cores are in use here. And we see these four jobs running simultaneously in the HTOP window. And now we see that the wall clock time has actually increased to 14.7 or 14.9. And the process time is actually still roughly equal to the same amount. And we again get a ratio of roughly one, a tiny variation in this last one, but roughly one overall. And again, because all of our virtual cores were running, then they, in this situation, there was no difference between the two. However, because the virtual cores are having to make use of one, each, each two virtual cores is making use of one physical core, we actually see that in this case, the time roughly doubled from the previous situations. So now let's look at a case where we run eight copies of this program. So in this case, we see that all four of our virtual cores are running 100%. If we look at the individual jobs now, they are only running at 50% of the process time because there are eight jobs, so they can only get 50% each of one CPU core. And we see now that there is a difference between the wall clock time and the process time. The wall clock time is roughly doubled from our previous case up to now about 30 seconds, but the process time remains roughly the same as before, around 14.7, 14.8. And here we see that there's therefore a ratio of two between the wall clock time and the process time. And that makes sense here because the total time elapsed from start to finish of each one of these jobs is roughly double the actual amount of time that that job spent on the processor. So I ran a number of tests of this with different numbers of jobs from one up to eight. And we'll now take a look at the, all of the results summarized on a graph. I collected data on timing for running between one and eight simultaneous copies of this timing test program. And we see that for four jobs or fewer, the process time and wall clock time are roughly in agreement. If we go beyond four copies of the job, 
then we see that the wall clock time increases, whereas the processor time remains roughly constant. And this is consistent with the system behavior based on having four virtual cores. Once we exceed the number of virtual cores, then the system will have to rapidly switch the different processes on or off the different cores, and this will increase the wall clock time. However, each individual job will only remain on the core for the same amount of time, and therefore the processor time will remain roughly equal. Another useful way to look at this data is in terms of ratios. And if we look at processor time divided by wall clock time, then we see that this is roughly one for four jobs or fewer, and then starts to decrease after we exceed four. And this really gives us an indication that the number of virtual cores in this system is equal to four. However, another way to look at this is to look at the wall clock time for n jobs compared to the wall clock time for one job. And here, we see that there is a decrease after we exceed two jobs, which is the total number of physical cores on the system. And this indicates that while hyperthreading may be useful technology for the system as a whole, in terms of running many applications with many different threads, it often doesn't really provide any real boost in terms of raw performance for scientific computing applications. What happens once we exceed two cores is that the jobs that we're running just have to compete for those two physical cores are just rapidly being switched on and off. And so therefore, there is limited benefit in running beyond the two physical cores available. With these results in mind, we'll now take a look at timing the LU factorization and Cholesky factorization for different matrix sizes n. Let's now take a look at the program LU underscore time dot pi that we can use for timing the LU factorization. And in this program, we're going to loop over a variety of matrix sizes from m equal 10 up to about 4,500. And within the loop, we'll construct a random m by m matrix that we're going to apply the LU factorization to. We'll then store the initial process time and the initial wall clock time. And one issue that we have when we time functions that execute very rapidly is that there's only a certain limit on precision for our timing routines and therefore one way that we can improve accuracy is to run many instances of the function and then take the average time and so I'm going to do that here so I'm going to make a loop where I call my LU function many times and I'm going to keep on calling it until 0.2 seconds of wall clock time has elapsed I'm also counting the number of calls that I made to the LU function, and I can use that then to calculate the average time for the LU function. I'm going to print the results to the terminal. I'm going to print the problem size, the number of calls that were made, the average wall clock time, and the average process time. And since I'm interested in the asymptotic scaling of the LU time taken, then I'm going to look at my results on a log-log plot and therefore it makes sense to increase my m each time through this loop by a multiplicative factor. And so here then I'm going to in increase m by 10% each time I pass through this loop. So now let me run this program. So I see the four columns of output here, the matrix size, the number of calls that were done to the LU function, and then my wall clock time and process time. And I've previously run this program, and I stored the results in a file called LUT10. And we'll now take a look at the results. And these tests were run on a Apple iMac with a 10-core Intel processor. So now let me plot the results here. So I'm going to plot column 3 that contains the wall clock time. And I'm going to plot column 4 that contains the process time. And so we see something rather interesting happen here. In our previous timing example, we saw that there are cases where 
process time can be lower than war clock time. This can happen if we run a program on a busy CPU. In that case, because our program has to compete with other programs on the system, it only spends a fraction of the total wall clock time actually running on the CPU, and therefore the process time can actually be lower. So here we're seeing the opposite behavior. We actually see that the process time is substantially larger than the wall clock time. And the reason for this is that SciPy's LU function is multi-threaded. It makes use of a library called OpenMP that allows the LU factorization to be parallelized and run using multiple threads that are running on multiple CPU cores simultaneously. And since each of those threads accumulates processor time and we have multiple running simultaneously, we actually have process time accumulating faster than wall clock time. And that then leads to the plot that we, we see here. So we can actually look at the routine just running on a single core. And to do that, we can run our program, but specify a system variable called omp underscore num underscore threads, set that equal to one, and that will then tell the LU function to only run on a single core. So we'll now run the timing test again. And in this case, we actually see that the wall clock time and process time are in near perfect agreement. And that is what we would expect because this CPU is idle other than running this job. And we're running on a single core and the process time should therefore roughly match the wall clock time taken. So we have these timing results here. And now let's overlay those results on top of our previous results. And these results were saved previously to a file called LUT1. And here we see that the wall clock time and process time are near identical, and therefore the blue line actually just overlays the, the, the purple line. So as before, we see that as the problem size increases, the time goes up, but we see that as the problem size increases, the multi-threaded version takes substantially less wall clock time and we see that there's an increasing gap between the blue line and the orange line here and this is a pretty common feature when writing multi-threaded programs often they become more efficient when the problem size becomes larger and there's more work that can be shared amongst the threads we can actually notice here that if we go to very small matrix sizes, that the single threaded version is slightly more efficient than the multi-threaded one. This is also a common feature because launching multiple threads often comes with a certain performance overhead cost. And therefore, it can actually be more efficient for very small problems just to run a single threaded job. So now let's concentrate on the single threaded performance. And what we're going to do now is we're going to compare the single threaded performance for the LU factorization with the Cholesky factorization. And I have a second program called call underscore time dot pi that has the same format as the LU timing fu function, but will perform the Cholesky factorization instead of the LU factorization. And since Cholesky can only work on symmetric positive definite matrices, then we pass it a symmetric positive definite matrix by first constructing a random M by M matrix and then looking at 
A multiplied by A transpose. So now let me run this program using one thread. And I previously saved these results to a file called call t1 and will now compare it to the LU times. And so we see here that the Walcott time for Cholesky is less than the Walcott time for the LU function. And this agrees with our asymptotic scaling results where we saw that Cholesky should take a factor of two fewer floating point operations. And indeed, if we look at this plot, we see that's roughly consistent. We can also look at the form of this plot and we see that for very small matrices, we have some performance that doesn't scale in the same way as for large matrices. And this is also fairly common. Often when we look at the asymptotic performance, then we're more interested when we get to larger matrices. For small matrices, there could be other things that are going on, um, such as, for example, the time actually spent in Python's routines evaluating the the wall clock time in this function. So we can actually look now at how this time is scaling and we expect from our operation counts that it should scale like the problem size cubed. And so what I'll do here then is I'll add in a line that is scaling like the cube and I'm going to roughly estimate the prefactor here to make it align with the with the data that we have and if I estimate this and I put in this line scaling like x cubed with some prefactor then we can see that there's very good agreement for large matrix sizes in terms of the how the time is scaling for the LU and Cholesky. So that really matches what we expected from our theoretical analysis. In our timing study, we saw that the LU factorization and the Cholesky factorization had the expected scaling where the total time taken was scale like order n cubed. And we saw that it was possible to deal with matrices where n was several thousand, but because of this order n cubed scaling, if n becomes much larger, then these problems will really become expensive to compute. And because of this, we might want to look for classes of problems where we could improve upon this basic n cubed scaling. And one type of problem where we could often do better is when we're dealing with sparse matrices. And here, the term sparse matrix is not precisely defined, but it essentially refers to any matrix where most of the entries are zero. And matrices of this type emerge in many different practical situations. And we'll see in unit three of the course where we'll often have sparse matrices when we discretize partial differential equations. From a computational point of view, it's often advantageous if we store sparse matrices just in terms of their non-zero entries. And we actually refer to the set of non-zero entries 
in a sparse matrix as defining its sparsity pattern. And suppose we look at this example 5x5 five five matrix where there are twos on the top row and ones along the remaining diagonal terms. So we could represent this matrix in dense format and that would require 25 numbers to store all of the entries. But an alternative way to represent this would be in terms of index pairs, row and column, that are non-zero and the corresponding non-zero entry. And if we look at this matrix scaling up to larger and larger sizes with the same sparsity pattern where we just have entries in the top row and along the diagonal, then this compressed representation where we just store these non-zero entries will ultimately become much more efficient. From a mathematical point of view, sparse matrices are no different than dense matrices. But from a scientific computing perspective, sparse matrices require different data structures and algorithms for computational efficiency. And it's worth noting that the LU factorization and Cholesky factorization are tailored more toward dense matrices. And if we apply the LU factorization or Cholesky factorization to a sparse matrix, then we often have this undesirable effect where many entries that were zero turn into non-zero entries due to the various row operations and manipulations that these algorithms do. And this phenomenon is referred to as fill-in. And it can therefore mean that from a matrix A, you may end up with a factor L that is now much less sparse than your original matrix A. And there are many different approaches that can be taken to alleviate this problem. There are various reorderings that can be done of a matrix to try and minimize fill-in. And then there are whole other classes of algorithms that we might be able to use on sparse matrices. And this is really a huge subject that we're not going to look into detail here. We will touch on it later on in the course, but it's certainly something to just be aware of if you ever encounter sparse matrices in practice.